All right, Acts chapter 2. We began in Acts chapter 1 last week by asking this question. Jesus has risen from the dead because y'all remember Easter, right? You remember Easter a few weeks ago? Everybody was here. Everybody was here. We didn't have enough chairs. Parking lot was a mess. Children's ministry, chaotic, but awesome. And everybody was here. And, and it's often we get ramped up about Easter. And, and now what? Now what? He's, he's risen. Now what? And I think that that was a question that the first century disciples had. You're risen. Now what? They, they thought that he was going to um, uh, rise up a, a military institute, retake uh, Israel from Rome, overthrow Rome, administer justice, set up his kingdom in Israel. So they, they, they had an idea of what he was going to do, but he, he didn't do any of that. What he did next really shocked them and shocked the world. What he did next was he inaugurated a new season of ministry on earth. God activity between man and humans changed post-resurrection. So Jesus didn't come to fulfill something old only. He did fulfill something old. He fulfilled the old covenant. He, he, he made atonement for sin. There was a sin gap. Somebody had to pay for sin. We couldn't do it. He was only a complete man, both fully man, fully God, perfect in nature that could make atonement for sin. His death fulfilled the old covenant. His resurrection launched a new one. And so we find ourselves in a new epoch of time, a new era of time in which God is ministering to the world through people. And he calls this season that we're in, Jesus calls this season that we're in the kingdom of God. He was constantly talking about the kingdom of God, the reign of God on earth through a kingdom it is not found geographically. It is found within the hearts of men. So the throne of God is not in a city. It will be one day, but currently the throne of God, this kingdom of God resides within the hearts of every believer. And God is reigning on earth through his people. And in, in the book of Acts, we see the beginning of this kingdom reign. Now, again, Jesus modeled it. He even gave us hints. Like, how do we know? We just sang, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as in, as in heaven. He told us to pray that, right? Yes or no? Thy kingdom come, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth. Everybody say here. here. On earth as is in heaven. That's something that we're not just to pray. It's something that we're to expect to see. All prayers should have an expectation behind them. So pray the kingdom comes and expect to see the kingdom come. Or was it look like when the kingdom comes? Jesus gave us pictures. He said, if I cast out a devil by the hand of God, then I tell you, by God, the kingdom has come upon that individual. So deliverance is a sign of the kingdom of God manifesting on earth or upon a human. He says, when you see healing, that's the kingdom of God. When you see salvation, that's the kingdom of God that has come upon a person. Heaven has come to visit that situation, that person, that environment. And we're to live not just praying, God sovereignly come. I'm going to get out of the way so that heaven can come for mama or so that heaven can come for this situation or that heaven can come from this wayward child or that heaven can come. I'm just going to pray and just kind of sit back. No, no. He said, I'm going to do it through you. Heaven's going to come because you're going to pray for them and I'm going to heal them. Heaven's going to come because you're going to command the devil to go and it's going to flee. Heaven's going to come because you're going to proclaim the gospel and they're going to get saved. So heaven is not a, a have, the kingdom of God requires the involvement of kingdom people. God in his sovereign will could have done it without us. Do you believe that? Does he have the capacity to do all things without us? Yes or no? Of course he does. But in his sovereign will, he chose to administer the kingdom, to bring the kingdom, and to facilitate the kingdom through people. People who not just have Jesus in their heart, but people who are led and empowered. Everyone say empowered. 
led and empowered by the Spirit of God. So last week we discovered that he inaugurated this kingdom. He started this kingdom. We're in this season of the kingdom. And the first thing that he did was he brought his spirit to baptize these believers. There was a subsequent work of God. They were already saved. And he told them, I've given you an assignment. And your assignment is to go to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go evangelize the nation. I'm going to give you tools and resources to do that. But don't take a step. He says this in Acts chapter 1. Do not leave Jerusalem until you are filled with power from on high. For John baptized you with water, but in a few days from now, I will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So you can't do what you have been saved and called to do without this baptism. He said, don't even try it. And this is one of the major things that's wrong with Christianity, especially Western Christianity, especially Protestant Western Christianity, is that we've been trying to accomplish a mission without the empowerer of the mission. God the, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Bible. That's been our trinity. We love God the Father, we love God the Son, and we love our Bible. But this Holy Spirit cat, he's weird. And we have avoided, we have avoided our only chance at pulling this off. The only chance we have at pulling off what God has... Listen, if you just want to get to heaven, then discard everything that I'm about to say for the next 12 weeks. If your goal is just to get to heaven, you will hate this church. I highly encourage you to go find another heaven-focused place that can equip you to just get to heaven. But my Christ did not tell me to get to heaven. He told me to bring heaven to earth. And I feel like I, feel like I owe it to him since he saved my life. I owe it to him to actually do what he's asking of me. And he's not asking me just to self-preserve self and make sure that my kids are going to get to heaven one day. No, we have an assignment here. There is a lost and dying world that does not have Christ, and they will not have Christ until the church of Christ is empowered by Christ. It ain't going to happen. So this new kingdom era that we find ourselves is not this, how can we all get to, no, 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 no. It's how can we all be filled with power, equipped to be radical disciples of Jesus Christ? And it's going to require something of you. More than an hour on Sunday. It's going to require more than a token prayer that you pray every single day. It's going to require everything of you. Everything. I'm tired of preachers and teaching. Preachers teaching people that God is some type of genie. Or some type of ATM that we go to every day to make withdrawals so that our marriage can be better, so that our life can get better, so that I can get a better job, so that I can get a lake house or the pontoon boat that I've been dreaming of, or find the best person to marry. God is not life help. He's the Messiah, and he deserves everything you have. Every dream, every goal is to be laid down at his altar. He's not here to bless your 401k. He's not here to try to get you to retirement so that you can be comfortable. He's here trying to save the world. And comfortable, complacent Christianity, American, comfortable, complacent Christianity is not helping the cause. Good morning. So we see in Acts chapter 1, what we see here is not just a transition. What we, hear, we see here is something completely new. So God drops his presence on these disciples. And the first thing that he gives them is super important. Not to be ignored, can't be ignored. All biblical scholars, if they're worth following. Credible biblical scholars will tell you that the law of first mention or the law of first cannot be ignored. Whenever God does something first, it is significant. So God sends his spirit. What's the first thing that happens when his spirit descends on people? They spoke in tongues. Exits are open. No one will judge you. 
If you need to quietly dismiss yourself, but for the next 30 minutes, I'm going to talk about tongues, and I'm going to answer two questions. We got two people in the room today. We got tongue talkers, tongue prayers, tongue singers. We got tongue people in here. But I'm going to, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to be willing to bet you that the majority of the tongue talkers don't know why they are. You don't know the purpose of it. I hope I'm wrong. But there's a lot of people, Pentecostal, charismatic backgrounds, they came out of the womb talking in tongues. And you were taught that you're not saved if you don't speak in tongues. And so in order to be saved, you made something up. You want to you go to heaven? So see me tie my bow tie. I should have bought a Honda, whatever it takes. I got to get to heaven. So a tongue talking, I will go. And you don't even know the purpose of it. You don't even know why it's there. And then we've got the other crowd that grew up traditional Baptist. You grew up Presbyterian. You grew up in a reformed theological church that taught you that it ceased, it's useless, and it no longer exists. And therefore, anyone who does it is not to be trusted. Run quickly. If you find yourself in an environment where that happens, go find the next church on the list. You were taught that. You don't know, you don't, you don't, and you don't even know why you believe that. Some, some man or some woman told you that it no longer exists and you took that as the word of God. I'm, I'm here to tell you that you both need to know why you believe the things that you do and you also need to know why you don't believe the things that you do. Because what if the voice that told you not to believe those things wasn't the voice of a man, but was actually the voice of the Antichrist? See, the Antichrist is anti anything that God wants to do to further the kingdom. So the Antichrist voice often projects from platforms like this. In order to convince those that have the capacity to change the world not to use the tools that God has given you to change the world to change the world. (laughs) So just because someone has a degree... Someone has a platform, has a YouTube page, has an Instagram page. doesn't mean that they're to be trusted. You are to be good Bereans. Bereans are those in the scriptures that heard the, the teachings of Paul but went to check the scriptures to make sure they were accurate. And if you're not going to do that every single week, you're not being a good Berean. I don't care how passionate I may come across. I don't, I, don't care, I don't care what feeling you may sense in the room. You better go check your scriptures to make sure that what I'm saying is in line. Especially for your kids. Do you know how many generations of kids have been taught that the Holy Spirit is the enemy when he's actually here to help? So we've raised up generations of of kids, of children, who simply go to church, pay a tithe, and try to be a good person. And we're trying to figure out why the Christian faith is impotent. Because we have indoctrinated children with religion instead of teaching them to follow and obey the Word of God. And we're guilty. Before you clap. We're all guilty of it. God never wanted to teach his people how to be good church people. He sent his son and then gave us his spirit so that we could be a prophetic company of people led by the voice of God. And his voice will never lead us outside of the bounds of scripture. So if you're hearing anything, what I'm saying that I'm anti I'm not anti-scripture. The scripture acts as guardrails to guide us in this spirit-led journey with Jesus Christ. And if I think that the Spirit is telling me to step over a guardrail, it's not the Spirit of Christ. It's probably the Spirit of the devil. So if I hear the Spirit of Christ telling me, hey, divorce your wife because you no longer love her, that's not the Spirit of God. That's the Spirit of the devil. Because Jesus said, I hate divorce. Good morning. So we have to be people who can discern our emotions in our own voice and the voice of the devil from the voice of God. Well, how can I do all of that? Well, be in a relationship. There's a room full of 250 people here this morning. If my wife begins to talk, I can catch her voice in a room. Why? Because I've spent time with her. Spend time with God, you'll know his voice. Okay. All right. So Acts chapter 1, he inaugurates this new season. We've got to get going. <laughs> Acts chapter 2, the Spirit of God falls. Let's see what happens. Verse 1. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly... A lot of people think it's an upper room. 
Okay, I'm going to challenge you on that. It's not in an upper room because we have all of these people present. I think it was the temple, which was often translated upper room. Okay, so the same Greek that's used for this upper room is also used for the house of God or the temple of God. I think they were at church. I think they were praying. And I think the spirit of God descended upon them. They were in one accord. They were praying, waiting for exact. They were being obedient. They were waiting for what God promised. And then they easily, if they would have stepped out of the temple at that point, they would have been in mass crowds of people at the temple mount, which would have made perfect sense. If they would have been up a room, they, so I, I, you know, just for your notes, I think that this is probably they're in the temple. And then suddenly there came from heaven a sound, a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And the presence filled the entire house where they were sitting and divided tongues of fire appeared on them and rested on each one of them and they were all filled with the holy spirit and began to speak in tongues everybody say tongues everybody say it i know you don't want to just say it tongues yeah that's what it was and the spirit gave them utterance skip down to verse 11 both jews and converts of two judaism cretans arabs were here uh we saying we hear them declaring the wonders of god in our own tongues Amazed and perplexed, they asked each other, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said they've had too much to drink. Those are the two reactions in the beginning. Those are still the two reactions today. What does this mean? There are some people that have enough. Uh, let me say that. There are some people that are willing to bypass emotion and ask serious questions like, I know this makes me uncomfortable, but I wonder what this means. Is there significant meaning behind this? But some will dismiss it altogether and say, ah, they're foolish, drunk people. Oh, they're silly. They're being the flesh. And because of your emotions, you might dismiss the very blessing that God wants to give you. For your own personal victory, tongues, personal victory and victory in ministry. That's why it was given. Okay? So... We have a first happening, tongues. What is tongues? Tongues is speech inspired by the Holy Spirit, either in a language that is known or a language that is unknown. There are two Greek words used for tongues in scriptures, glossia and dialecto. Glossia, meaning unknown language, God gives you. Dialecto, where we get the word dialect, known language. Both are used, both are used in order to glorify God, edify people, and reveal a fuller picture of Christ. That's why it's given, okay? So, I'm gonna tell you the main objections to tongues. Maybe you've heard some of them, maybe you haven't. Again, if you speak in tongues, you may be hit with one of these objections. You need to know why I don't think that that objection is a very valid objection. If you don't speak in tongues, I'm gonna try, and, and, and know my heart here, I'm gonna try to convince you to at least pursue as to why this might be helpful for you, okay? First objection, it's not of importance. Well, if it's not important, why is it in Scripture? If it's not important, why was it the first thing that was given at Pentecost? If it's not important, why was it used throughout the New Testament? If it's not important, why was it the second most major manifestation of the Spirit when the Spirit of God came upon people, okay? So if it's not important today, you have to ask, why was it important then? And then follow that question up with, why is it no longer important today? When did it cease being important? Okay? All right. So not only have, do you have to dismiss Acts chapter 2, the teachings of Paul, but you also have to dismiss the very words of Christ. The Great Commission is the assignment of all believers. Yes or no? I'm setting you up, so if you don't want to say yes, I understand. But the Great Commission in all four of the Gospels was not just for those 12 or those listening. The Great Commission was given to every single one of us, meaning every single one of us have been given the call to go make disciples of all nations. In Mark's version of the Great Commission, it includes what demonstration of the Spirit's power while accomplishing the Great Commission will look like. He gives us details. And this is what he said. Jesus said, these miraculous signs will accompany those who believe. They will cast out demons in my name. Uh-oh, that's another sermon later. And they will speak in new tongues. 
They will. These are future believers. If you look at that, I mean, again, break it, be a good Berean. Look at the whole thing in context. Break it down. What is he talking about? Who is he talking about? He's not just talking about those who believe. He's talking about all future ones who will believe. That's why he uses the grammar. Will accompany those that believe or who will believe? Who will believe? And it's talking about spirit activity, spirit realm activity amongst these new believers. So again, Jesus said that it's going to happen. Joel said it's going to happen. Peter said, I'm confirming that this is what's happening. And then we see that activity throughout the New Testament. Okay? So to say that it's not biblically important is to essentially do away with these. It's a silly argument. Okay? You can't say that it's not important. Okay? Argument two would be, no, I, I, I grant that it had biblical significance, but that has ceased. It no longer exists. There is a doctrine in traditional Protestantism, which most of us are a part of, particularly through the Reformation. It was birthed at the Reformation. Reformation thought is that certain gifts of the Spirit have ceased. They have ceased. The doctrine is called cessationism. So there's a couple of camps within Protestant faith. There's certain camps that believe that all gifts of the Spirit, that supernatural things of God, no longer happen. And there's certain beliefs that they have continued. So there's continuationism and there's cessationism. Okay, so the cessationist camp says, and I'm not, I'm not trying to put all cessationists into one bucket because there's actually different forms. But by and large, there's a group of people that say that at the end of the apostolic era, when the last apostle died, so did all the gifts of the Spirit. All of the gifts. The gifts of the Spirit were given to confirm the message of Jesus and to establish the faith. And once the faith was established, all of the supernatural signs ceased. No longer needed. Now all we have is God's Word. God's love and natural things that we do. Which I'm going to go out on a limb here and say most of the stuff that we do, if we're obedient, is supernatural. <laughs> so to say that all the supernatural stuff is ceased, that's, that's, that is a large statement. Now, one of the verses that's used specifically with tongues, let's get back to that, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. All right, all right, now, Corinthians in context... We have a whole chapter, 12, dealing with gifts of the Spirit. A whole chapter dealing with gifts of the Spirit, talking about gifts of the Spirit. Chapter 13, which is supposedly this chapter where he says all things are about to cease, is about love. So gifts of the Spirit are to be operated and, and accomplished through love. If you're not loving these people, then don't operate in the gifts. Because he says you'll hurt people and you'll, you'll give God a bad image if you're doing this out of vain, selfish ambition. So operate in the gifts, but operate in love. And then chapter 14, which we'll spend some time here in a minute, is all about tongues, how to, how to operate in tongues correctly. So if he's going to talk about the gifts, talk about operating in love, and then talk about tongues, why would, he, why, would, why would we have this one verse, which I think is taken out of context, which says they're all going to cease? Why would he spend so much time teaching us about them if he had the knowledge that they're going to cease? <laughs> if I knew that something was, was going to end next week, would I, would I do an eight-week series talking about how to prep you for the thing that we're just going to do for five days? Paul's a little bit smarter than that. But here's the verse that's used, just so you'll know where you get it from. If you're a cessationist, just know where this is where you get it from. You get it from this verse that says, love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. So these things are going to disappear. I agree. When are they going to disappear? When completeness comes. What's completeness? Do you know what cessationists say? The canonization of Scripture. So when we had our canonized version of Scripture which was well over 600 years from when this was wrote, written, that no longer would the gifts be needed. So did we have them for 600 years and then the date that the Bible was published? It just like, whoop, they all sucked out. They're all gone. 
Was somebody in the middle of healing someone and the, the moment that the Bible got printed, like, oh, sorry, you got to live with it. Perfection just came. Completeness just came. This, I'm telling you, this is how asserted. This is the argument that they use. So ask cessationists why they believe what they believe. And this is what they're going to tell you. They're going to tell you that they believe that the completeness is the canonization of Scripture. Scripture's not complete. Don't email me. It doesn't completely explain all the things that we need to know. God never intended for us to rely on a book. He intended on us to rely upon him, his presence, his spirit. And this is what bothers those of Reformation thought and those of cessationist doctrine. It seeks to control so that things can't get out of bounds again. The Reformation, correct? I'm not anti-Reformation. 90% of what we have is wonderful. It needed to be done. But in fear of the faith being abused like it was by the Catholic Church, they had to put constraints that didn't just constrain people from abusing the faith. It constrained the Holy Spirit from being God. So this verse, taken way out of context, because verse 12 that I didn't read goes on to say, for now we see only in a, as in a reflection of a mirror. But then, talking about when the day of perfection comes, then we will see him face to face. What's it talking about? It's talking about heaven. In heaven, we're not going to need words of knowledge. We're not going to need prophecy. We're not going to need healing. We're not going to need tongues. Why? Because I'm standing in front of him. And everybody's perfect. There's no one to prophesy to. There's no one to speak tongues to. Listen, I don't need the gifts of the Spirit because I am perfect and so is he and so is everyone else. <laughs> the gifts of the Spirit for ministry. I don't need to do ministry. The only thing that I need is 1 Corinthians chapter 13, to love him. <laughs> the third objection is it's not for everyone, it's just a gift. Raise your hand if you've ever heard that before about tongues. It's not for everyone, it's just a gift that some have. Right? Just be honest, it's okay. We're not going to take a picture of you. All right. All right, so I agree that the gift of tongues is not for everyone because it is a gift. But there is a grace of tongues that's available to all. We'll prove it. Okay, I will. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 lists the gifts that tongues... Read it for yourself. It lists the gift that tongues is included. You know what is also included in those gifts? Faith. Raise your hand if you have faith. Uh-oh. Yeah, you have a measure. You know what gift means? Increased measure of. So everyone has the grace of those things. You have a measure of those things. You have a measure of faith. You have a measure of knowledge. You have a measure of wisdom. You have a measure of healing. You have a measure of tongues. You have a measure of miracles. Can God use anyone to do a miracle if he chooses? So you have a measure of those capacities, but to some is given a gift. An increased measure of. So when people say, well, it's, it's, it's a gift. Yeah, I agree, it's a gift. But you also have a measure of it. Well, I, how can you prove that? 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 5. Be a good Berean. Now, I want you all, say all, put the, put the text up there. 1 Corinthians 14, 5. I want, I want you all, everybody say all. all. You know what that means in the Greek? Everybody. I want you all to speak in tongues. But even more so, I want you to prophesy. Why would he be telling a group of people that don't have the capacity to do it that he wants you to do it? I want you all, say all, all, to speak in tongues. But more so, I want you to prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues. In value, no. In spiritual gifting, no. What's he talking about? He's talking about the corporate environment. Read the text. He's talking about how to operate in the gifts in the corporate environment. He said, in the corporate environment, it's greater to prophesy than it is to speak in tongues. Why? Because if I'm prophesying, everyone will understand me. If I'm speaking in tongues, usually only God understands me unless there is an interpreter, unless someone interprets so that the church may be built up. The purpose of the gathering is to build up the church. But if I'm speaking in a language that only me and God understand, then you're not being built up. You're just being entertained at most. 
Unless somebody stands up and says, this is what he's saying, or the person themselves. Most of the time, the interpretation didn't come from someone else. It came from the person, most of the time, if you read first century church activity. So he says, I want you all to speak in tongues. But in this environment, we need to prophesy. We need to hear the voice of God and declare what God is saying so that everyone can be built up together. Why was he saying that? Because the Corinth church had no problem with speaking in tongues. They had no problem with supernatural. They were tongue talkers. They were giving messages in tongues. Some were edified, most were not. And especially the guests. He goes on to say, if you're talking in tongues and that's all you're doing on a Sunday morning, then guests are going to come in and they're going to think you're out of your mind. And you're actually working against what God is trying to accomplish. So in this environment... You can pray in tongues if you want to. You can sing in tongues if you want to. But if you ever feel like doing something in tongues that you think is going to confuse people or not lead people closer to God, then you better make certain that it's God. (laughs) Grace for all, gift for some. All right, so let's wrap it up. Is it from God? Well, absolutely. Scriptures tell us from God. Is it important? Absolutely. It wouldn't be in the Bible if it's not important. Is it available for all? Yes. All right, then why should I want it? Here's a few reasons. Number one, you need it for what Scripture is going to call worshiping in spirit and in truth. Worshiping in spirit. Have you ever wondered how can one worship in spirit? What does it look like to worship in spirit? 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 2 says, For the one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men but to God, for no one understands him, but he he utters mysteries in the Spirit. So there is a ministry from my spirit to God who is spirit when I am singing, worshiping, or praying in tongues. I am bypassing my brain. I'm bypassing my feelings and I'm worshiping in spirit. Have your feelings ever tried to prevent you from worshiping God? Have your feelings ever tried to prevent you from praying? I don't feel like it today. I'm tired. Has your body ever tried to prevent you? All right, so then what do I do in those moments where my body or my soul doesn't feel like it? I turn my spirit loose and I begin to pray in the spirit. Bypassing soul, bypassing body, bypassing mind. I am praying to God not hindered by emotions, not hindered by fatigue, spirit to spirit. Jesus said there's going to come a day where people don't, he's, he's painting a picture of religion. It's not about this space where you worship God. It's not about this worship band. It's not about this speaker. It's not about this building. He said there's going to be a day where true believers worship God in spirit and in truth, meaning that no matter where they are, they can open it up and just go. They don't, need a, they don't need the keyboard to get crunk up. They don't need their favorite iPod. No, they can just turn it on like a valve. They can just turn it on and get after it. Jesus said that day's coming. He prophesied to it. And it's here. It's here. Number two is for personal prayer and self-edification. It, it does have a value for you. 1 Corinthians 14, 4. Even though Paul knew that it was all about to end, he (laughs) teaches a whole chapter about it. I'm being silly. The one who speaks in the tongue builds up himself, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. So the one who's speaking in tongues, praying in tongues, and worshiping in tongues, not only are we bringing worship to God, but one of the things that Paul says is happening is you are edifying self. What do you mean? You're praying things for yourself that you don't know you need to pray for. Get this. Oh, this is going to get some of you. You're praying things that the Spirit of God knows that you don't know yet or you refuse to acknowledge. So you're praying in tongues. What are you praying? God, help him with his prideful self. <laughs> his pride is about, to re- is about to result in a major fall. And your spirit is working with God to sanctify you. God, help him with this situation that's about to happen in two weeks. Because God, who is not confined by time, is actually out of time and can see 
when it's about to happen and your spirit cooperating, who is entangled with his spirit, but also praying to him who is spirit, is actually praying for this event that's about to happen. See, if you knew all of those things, you would be doing it very often. But most people don't know these things because it's kept from them because it's weird and it might affect our church growth. It might affect our offering. It might affect our dignity. So we keep this, if you are a charismatic church, especially in the modern day world, especially a mega charismatic church, you keep it in the back room somewhere. Because you don't want to freak out the donors. You don't want to affect the paycheck. We need to repent. And, and who we're affecting? Pastors who do this, you know who they're affecting? You. They're robbing you of something that God has beautifully given you for the edification of self and the advancement of the kingdom. It's stolen from. The third is for intercession. You, you're praying. Have you, ever, have you ever wanted to pray and didn't know what to pray? Yes or no? Romans chapter 8. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, not your brain. The Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we don't know. My mind, my mind doesn't, I'm drawing blanks. My mind is not helping me. We don't know what we ought to pray, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through what? Wordless groans. Wordless groans. Can be interpreted just groans, because that's happened when I've been praying in the Spirit, just it doesn't sound like, see me tie my bow tie. It doesn't sound like I should have bought a Honda. It sounds like, oh, ah. If people were to walk in, they would, they would call 911. That's just as effective as your eloquent doxology that you recite or your, your creed that you recite or scriptures. You, it's, it's sometimes just as effective that groan those wordless th things that you don't think are making any sense. I hear that all the time. Tongues doesn't make sense. It's made up. So is English. <laughs> God did not invent English. We put together some syllables and they have meaning for us. Every language. Every language is false except for that language. <laughs> if you really want to think about it. We're not going to be speaking German or Spanish or English in heaven. <laughs> what, is, what are we doing? We think we're so smart. If I were to tell you you can get all of these things by, by speaking in Spanish, no one's offended. Rosetta Stone, here we come. But if I say you got to get these things by speaking in tongues, oh, 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 oh. that's crazy. What is it? It's the spirit of the Antichrist trying to rob you and rob others. It's demonic in nature. It's demonic. I'm telling you, it's straight up demonic. John Ramirez, who is here, ex Satanist high priest. Speaks of the things that he did in the spirit realm. Speaks of the things that he did in the natural realm. Led by the devil himself. Said the number one thing we hate the most is when Christians pray in tongues. Often when I'm praying in tongues, God will let me see what I'm praying for. I'll see a picture of someone. I'll see a picture of a nation. I'll see a picture. There's testimonies of people that have been praying in the spirit. And God will take them into the spirit. Take them in the spirit to that place. Like, they'll go there. They're like, well, that's just really, you think they're transporting? Have you not read how many times in Scripture it says, I was taken there, either in the, either in the spirit or the natural, I cannot remember, but I was taken to this place? The whole book of Ezekiel. The whole book. But if it happens today, oh, it is religious and demonic, I'm telling you. I know, we're almost done. <laughs> Number four, for a public message. 
for a public message. This is what we see in Acts chapter 2. They're speaking in, uh, some, people, some people say, no, they weren't speaking in an unknown language. They were speaking in known languages. Okay. But I've got a bunch of uneducated people speaking in foreign languages, hundreds of different foreign languages so that everybody can hear. That's a miracle. Or they were all speaking in the same unknown language and the people heard it in their own language. Still a miracle. Who cares? She's seen this before. I've seen this before. We've been praying in another nation and they hear it in their tongue. I don't know if I was speaking their tongue or if they just heard it in their tongue. I don't care. It didn't matter. They heard it. It's a miracle. Why? When I released control of my tongue and gave it to the Lord. He took it and he used it. 1 Corinthians 14, 13. For this reason, the one who speaks in a tongue should pray that they may interpret what they say. So when it's in public, and there's one thing to speak. All right, how can I, how can I tell? Because I've, I've, I myself have done this. Other speakers have done this. They'll be preaching and they'll just, all of a sudden, they'll begin to pray in tongues. If I'm addressing my focus to the Lord, it's okay for me to do this in a corporate setting. Just for a minute, if I need to get my... Often I'll pray, when I'm praying for a person, I'll, I'll say, can I pray in the Spirit real quick? And the reason I want to do that is because it's often while praying in the Spirit that God gives me revelation about what I need to know. And so I'll just pray in the Spirit for a minute, just wait to hear from the Lord, and then I'll pray in English with that individual. But if it's for a message, for a corporate body, which happened from time to time, then there must be an interpretation in order for it to be received as prophecy, as the Word of God. If there is no interpretation by the individual or by someone else, then it's not to be considered a word from God in that moment. All right, so in review. Come on, Blake. Tongues is from God. Tongues is for everyone. Tongues is for the person, purpose of getting close to God, praying the perfect will of the Father, communicating for God in public, interpreting for God, but also for the intercession and benefit of others. These are all the reasons we see in Scripture. So how do I get past the fact that I feel weird about it? Well, <laughs> this is not the only weird thing about what we do. Have you ever said outside what you, out loud what you believe? Have you ever said out loud what you believe? It's weird. I believe in one God who's actually three persons who created everything with his voice. He himself was not created. He's always been. From his voice, he created all things. All things, he created them perfect. He created man who he loved very much. For about 33 minutes, it was all good. <laughs> then a woman listened to a snake Ate from a tree, wrong tree, not the right tree, but the wrong tree. Sin entered the world, fractured everything. They were kicked out of the garden. They had to put clothes on. Bad day. God created this institute called the Old Covenant, keeping them safe until he could get a Messiah here. Took a minute. Stubborn people, they were. Finally, the Messiah comes. Fully man. Fully God. Born of a virgin. Lived a perfect life. Because of that, people hated him. They killed him. Also part of God's plan. Because he didn't stay dead. On the third day, he came back to life. And soon and very soon, he's coming all to get us. On a white horse. Say that out loud at the next family reunion. Nutso. You're nutso. And you're having a hard time believing tongues? You can believe all of that other stuff and you have a hard time believing tongues? <laughs> it's insanity. Stand up. So where do I start? Where do I start? Some people ask me that in the first service. Where do we start? Well, I mean... Ministry team come forward. The, the, a good starting place is a laying on of hands. That's where the first church started. When people got saved, they would immediately go to them. They would pray the baptism on the Spirit over them. And, and almost every single time, at least that we see in Scripture, 
they were speaking in tongues. Now, do I believe that speaking in tongues is necessary again for salvation? No. Do I believe that it's necessary in order to do things for the Lord? No. I told you the reasons why it's important. Whether you choose to operate in it or not is up to you. It's completely up to you. But I think that there is strong, strong evidence that this was given first for a reason. And I think there's strong evidence that it's for you and for others. This is an aid that the Lord has given you. So if you want it, I would say receive prayer and then just begin. Just begin. Just open your mouth. You know, a lot of people are waiting for their tongue to be taken by God and for their mouth to involuntarily begin to talk and for there to be a, like a whole language that you're, you're fully fluent in a day. Like, how did you learn English? Did you wake up at one and a half years old, crawl in the crib and go, hello, mother and father. I know I haven't spoken up until this point, but I have much to say. No longer do I want that cereal. It's garbage. I would like a butter biscuit. And about these diapers, they're itchy. I do not like them. No, it's foolish. Nobody wakes up fluent. How did you start talking in English? Da, ma, papa, da da. And nobody looked at you and went, that's weird. Or nobody looked at you and went, oh, you idiot. Have you not figured this out yet? When are you going to learn to talk? Nor is your heavenly father going to look at you and go, you idiot. He's going to applaud every syllable. In the same way that you were applauded as a child for making effort, your heavenly father will applaud every effort. And he will add to your syllables, phrases, and then from your phrases, sentences. And before you know it, you will be in complete dialogue with the creator of heaven and earth. A powerful thing. Don't think that it's not. So just begin. Begin and try. Try, and, try in your quiet place. Try in your prayer time. Try, I, I found that the easiest way to try is when you're singing. Try to add what you would consider to be heavenly syllables and words while you're singing. Just try it. Just try it. You can't go wrong. Let me tell you this. <laughs> I don't think you can do it incorrectly. I think, listen, I think whatever syllables you offer in faith is tongues. If you're offering in faith, it's tongues. It's not like there's this written language that we're all trying to figure out. Nobody's tongue sounds the same. But if you're offering syllables in faith from your heart with a desire to commune with God, He will take it. He will embrace it. He will use it. He will take your syllables and form it to whatever he needs to form it in and then shoot it to India, shoot it to your family or shoot it to your daughter. Shoot it. Like he'll use it. He'll form All he needs is for you to open your mouth and speak. That's all he's waiting on. That's all he's waiting on. Well, that just doesn't make sense. Great. That probably means it's God. What do you think faith means? Let's pray together. Father, thank you for showing us pictures of these really, really important things. I'm sorry, on behalf of the church, on behalf of pastors, on behalf of our ancestors who did so many great things, reformed so many things, made so many things obtainable for us. But God, I stand in the gap and I apologize on behalf of Christian leaders who have tried to rob Christians of something so holy, so pure, and so powerful. Please forgive us. We, we, we thought we were doing what was right. But indeed, we were partnering with an antichrist spirit that was trying to suppress revival and to suppress and make impotent a powerful people. So I'm sorry, Lord. But we know truth now. And your word says that you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. So I'm praying freedom for a lot of people today in this area and many other areas. So keep your head bowed. Just know that the Altar is open today for many things, for salvation. Christ died so that you could receive him. Some of you are not in a relationship with God. You've been, you've been in a relationship with religion, but you've never been in a relationship with God. You, he wants you today. He wants you for himself today. Come to the altar, receive salvation. Enter into a relationship with God. It's so much better than church. 
Some of you need healing today. Your bodies are not coming into alignment with what Christ said. He died to give you healing. So let's go after your healing today. Some of you need deliverance. You're not yourselves. You're not sleeping. You're riddled with fear and anxiety, depression. It's not you. That's a spirit. That's a spirit trying to take life from you. Come receive prayer today. And some, some of you need power. You need some fresh power in your life. You need a gift of the spirit. Maybe it's tongues that you want to go after. Maybe it's other things. The altars are open today. Over 70% of the time, those things happened through the laying on of hands. I have some words of knowledge. We saw incredible healings last week Words of, through the words of knowledge. And hearing issues. If anyone has a hearing issue, I think it's either completely deaf or partially deaf in one ear. Come forward. I believe God wants to heal today. Nerve issues. If you have a nerve issue, I think it's, I think it's in your hands. I felt it in my hands. Some type of nerve issue. GI issues. If you have GI issues, chronic GI issues, come see me personally. I think I know the issue. So just come see me personally. I'll be down front. Ovary or hormonal issues. If your name is Candace and you have severe emotional pain, I heard the word Candace and then I saw crying deeply so it's either depression or emotional pain come forward we'd love to pray with you this morning all right so father in the name of jesus we thank you for your word we thank you for your empowerment we thank you for the holy spirit and we thank you for all manifestations of the spirit all of them every single one of them they're all beautiful we thank you for all of the gifts and all of the graces may we never be afraid may we never be afraid of what you've given us through the spirit jesus come come and receive the benefit of your suffering in the form of healing, deliverance, empowerment, salvation. Take the gifts that are about to be given, bless them to lead as many people as possible into a personal and growing relationship with you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.